I want to take a few minutes to talk about accelerated motion in special relativity. Now, some people are going to say, whoa, hang on, hang on. Special relativity is only about inertial reference frames, constant velocity motion. If you want to understand accelerated motion, you should be talking about general relativity. And to some degree, that's true. General relativity is the right framework to talk about motion that's non-inertial. But that's to talk about motion from the perspective of the non-inertial observer. We can actually learn a great deal by saying, sure, what's the you know, asking what's the proper time calculated along some accelerated path in special relativity. We do that all the time. We ask about what does an inertial observer see when they look at some other object or some other observer whose motion is non-inertial. Those are questions that are completely fair game for special relativity. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, okay, let's take the case of some observer on a rocket ship who feels constant acceleration Let's take that case and then let's study how different inertial observers will see that motion. And it turns out we're going to be able to learn an awful lot about that motion just from the point of view of those inertial observers. So I've got a whole bunch of stuff over here, a bunch of details we'll get to in a little bit, kind of. Uh, we'll get to those shortly. I've got a big uh, space-time diagram with hyperbola paper over here we'll use later. But I want to start just completely qualitatively. What does accelerated motion look like, generally speaking, if you're sitting in an inertial reference frame. So again, remember, the accelerated observer is going to be feeling constant acceleration. You know, their rocket engines will be pushing against them with a constant acceleration. But the inertial observer clearly won't see the acceleration being constant forever, or else they'd go faster than light eventually. That's not allowed. What does that look like? Well, if I were going to just sketch a space-time diagram, usual axes, time going this way, position going this way. If I were going to sketch a space-time diagram showing an accelerated observer, let's just say they start at rest. That seems like a sensible thing to do, starting at rest in our space-time diagram. That means their world line will begin basically vertical, because vertical means at rest. They're at the same position over multiple times. And they're going to accelerate. That means accelerating means they're going to start changing position faster and faster. They're going faster and faster in this picture. And now, qualitatively, we know that from the inertial observer's point of view, eventually, before too long, this accelerated observer is just going to get closer and closer to going the speed of light. So this is just going to go faster and faster. The speed of light in a space-time diagram is a 45-degree angle. And uh, that's the V equals C, and in our units, equals 1 in, in our special relativistic units the speed of light, and so the accelerated observer is just going to asymptotically approach some 45-degree 45, 45 angle line. Now, that's showing what happens if the observer starts at rest and moves farther and farther away from us faster and faster. But of course, if we're constant acceleration, we could describe motion where they're actually coming toward us very quickly, close to the speed of light, and we're hitting the brakes the whole time, slowing down, slowing down, hopefully they're not using brakes, slowing down, with constant acceleration opposing their motion until they come to a turning point instantaneously at rest in our frame and then they speed up and go away again. So we could draw the same kind of path here vertical there but gradually going until it reaches some 45 degree asymptote and that's going to be the idea of what accelerated motion is going to look like. Uh, we don't have the details here but it's going to be something like that where over time this accelerated observer will form some sort of curving path that asymptotically goes to 45 degree angles in the past and in the future. That's accelerated motion qualitatively. And I guess I should say, if they accelerate really quickly, all that means is they get very quickly to that 45 degree angle. Or they leave it very quickly. If they accelerate really slowly, that means their 45 degree angle asymptote is going to be way the heck out there but it's going to look basically the same. So this is kind of my expectation for what accelerated motion in relativity is going to look like, how it's going to behave. Okay, that's our background. Let's do a little bit of technical stuff. The calculations you need to describe accelerated motion are straightforward, but really tedious, and take a bit of wrangling equations. It's not fun. You would not enjoy watching me do it. I would not enjoy doing it again. It's a pain. But let me just give you some ideas of how you would shape those equations, how you would do this calculation. Step one is going to have to be defining some frames. So uh, as we usually do, I'm going to choose the home frame to be some inertial frame that I happen to be in. 
and I'll use the usual coordinates, t and x for time and position, acceleration a measured for the uh, accelerated observer, u is going to be the instantaneous velocity of that accelerated observer at some time, so u is dx dt, the usual sort of thing. Uh, then we're talking relativity, we're going to talk multiple reference frames. There will be some other frame that's also an inertial reference frame with primed coordinates, t prime and x prime for its position and time, for its time and position, a prime for the acceleration that it measures for the, accel for the observer, u prime is dx prime dt prime is the velocity it measures for the accelerated observer. Those are the other frame coordinates. And then those are the ones we can really deal with in special relativity. And then for the accelerated observer, we know that we can calculate that observer's tau, their proper time. And since tau is a Greek letter, I've decided that if at some point I want to talk about distances as measured by this accelerated observer, which is pushing our luck in special relativity, but if I find a way to do it, I'll call those positions, those distances, chi, because chi is a Greek letter that looks a bit like x. And the acceleration is constant for our accelerated observer. That constant accel acceleration I'll call alpha. So alpha is going to be a quantity that this, that this accelerated observer feels the same all the time. Okay, so that's our sort of definitions. We know that acceleration A is going to be du dt, change in velocity is measured in our, uh, in our in home frame. Or A prime, acceleration in the other frame, is du prime dt prime. That's just the rate of change of velocity is measured in the other frame. And if you play around with the velocity transformation equation, u prime in terms of u and t and all that sort of business, uh, and, and the relative velocity v between the two, between the home and other frames, if you play around with equations enough, you will reach this result. I'm not going to derive it for you. It's tedious. It's a pain. But in fact, I, when I was driving it myself, it was, I kind of didn't trust it was going the right direction for a while, and finally it worked, and it was kind of a miracle. So a prime equals gamma cubed a, where gamma is the usual relativistic gamma factor for the velocity between the home and other frame. We, we went over the square root of 1 minus v squared is our gamma factor. So the acceleration measured in the prime frame, the other frame, is equal to gamma cubed times the acceleration measured in the home frame. You can derive that. Lovely. So there's this relationship between the two measured accelerations. So that's all the back story of what, we, of what you can do. You can get to that point. Here's the trick to figure out how the accelerated motion looks in the home frame, what we can do is say, okay, at any given instant of time, at any given instant of that accelerated motion, that accelerated frame is going to be instantaneously at rest in some other frame. So at that instant, whatever instant we're looking at, gamma cubed A is equal to alpha, because that constant acceleration will be the acceleration in the other frame that is the instantaneous rest frame of that accelerated observer. So we're, we're, we're swapping in the instantaneous accelerated frame for the other frame in this equation. It's great. Uh, gamma cubed A equals alpha. Uh, that is, uh, that's an equation. Alpha is a constant in our assumption here. Gamma is a function of u, and A is just a u dt. That means this thing is a differential equation for u, first order differential equation. Again, this is tedious, but it's doable. You can solve this differential equation. Let me give you a hint if you want to do this at home, if you want to try it. There is a clever little identity you can use that show if you, the, where you can prove that the time derivative of gamma times u, where gamma now is tr in terms of the instantaneous velocity u, not in terms of some constant v, gamma times u, time derivative is equal to gamma cubed times a, gamma cubed times du dt. If you can prove that, then all you need to do is integrate this and alpha with respect to time, and you'll have something you can solve for u as a function of time and alpha. So that is a relatively straightforward process you can use to find u as a function of t. Once you've done that, you integrate with respect to time again to find position as a function of time, right? You've got velocity of t, now you go to you integrate to get position of time. In the process, we have to make some initial condition assumptions. We're going to just choose that at at the moment when u equals zero, when this, uh, when this uh, accelerated observer is at rest in the home frame, at that moment, we're going to choose that to be the time when t equals zero in the home frame, and we're going to choose position x equals, well, c squared over alpha, if you want to be in st standard SI units, or if we're taking c equals one like we usually do, that's just one over alpha. Position is one over alpha. 
maybe it's worth saying a word about units at this time. If our u is fraction of the speed of light, as it usually is in, in relativistic units, if u is just a number between minus 1 and plus 1, then du dt will be 1 over seconds, or 1 over years, or whatever your units for time are, 1 over years. So acceleration is in units of inverse time, or inverse whatever your measurement units are. I, I think of it as the inverse time. So x being equal to 1 over alpha just means x is measured in units of position, just as it normally, or units of time as it normally is in relativity. So OK, we've got, you can always put the c's back if you really want to. We do this. Let's just say we do these two integrals, integrate to find u of t and then to find x of t. Here's the result you come up with. You find, and I'm going to put it over here under this graph paper because this is where we're going to draw the graph in a minute. So I'll just put it here for reference. When I do those two integrals, my final result ends up being that x squared minus t squared equals 1 over alpha squared. That is the result we get for accelerated motion, in constant acceleration motion in special relativity. And this is actually kind of cool, because if you look at this, this is the equation for a hyperbola. In fact, it's an equation for the same kinds of hyperbolas that reflect the structure of space and time. We've been talking about these every time we've done space-time diagrams in relativity using this hyperbola paper. It's because space and time in relativity are based on exactly this sort of hyperbola. In other words, ex constant acceleration in relativity looks for all the world like it is tracing out the structure of space-time. This is interesting, and we'll see as we go along, this leads to some really cool effects in, as we try to interpret what this constant acceleration looks like. So OK, let me just say for the record that this is x and t in sort of an implicit equation, an equation for hyperbola. We can write them explicitly in terms of the proper time of the moving observer, the accelerated observer. Uh, I'm not going to try to drive that for you either. Sorry. Uh, you can do it yourself. Once you've done this double integral and all this business, you can work out what the proper time is. It, it works out. And uh, I'll just tell you, the result you get is the time coordinate is equal to 1 over alpha times the cinch, the hyperbolic sine, of alpha t. Notice that time is in seconds, alpha is in 1 over seconds, for example, and so that's unitless inside, like it has to be. And the position coordinate is equal to 1 over alpha times the cosh, the hyperbolic cosine, of alpha, oh, goodness, ah, almost wrong, not alpha t. Alpha, I promised it was the proper time, right? alpha times tau, the proper time, cosine, hyperbolic cosine, cosh, of alpha times tau. So if you know the proper time of your accelerated observer, you can just trace out t and x for any proper time as you go along. That's what we come up with. These are, these are different ways of framing the path of this object. OK, this is the part where we can start visualizing. I'm a very visual person. Now that I've thought through all this, I can look at what this looks like, and you know, our guesses here are going to turn out to be really accurate because this is just the hyperbola, x squared minus t squared equals 1 over alpha squared. That's just the hyperbola given by when t equals 0, x equals 1 over alpha, just like it was supposed to. Uh, OK, so this thing, I haven't put units on it yet. This is t and this is x. Let's just measure this in units of 1 over alpha. So I can say t measured in 1 over alphas, or I can say, let's just call this alpha times t. And this, let's call this alpha times x. So when x is 1 over alpha, alpha x equals 1. This is going to be my hyperbola. So let me just, I've already got the hyperbola there. This makes it really easy. I, let's say this marker works on this paper. I haven't tried this yet. Uh, let me just trace this path. Here we are, tracing my path along the x equals 1 over alpha line. OK, this is not actually working that well. But OK, you get the idea. I'm sort of highlighting this line. Pretend I'm just highlighting the hyperbola I care about down here. OK, cool. So that is my path. My path is going to be that one special hyperbola on this paper. That's the path of the accelerated observer. You can see it's exactly what we wanted here. It is vertical at time equals 0. It approaches 45 degrees in the plus and minus infinity because we know hyperbola paper pretty well. That's my plan. That's my, that's my observer's path. 
This is the part where we can start doing some fun stuff, now that I've established that part. The fun stuff is, what is the, what does this all look like in an other frame? So for example, let's just look at an other frame. Let's look at an other frame with relative velocity v equals 3 fifths. That's a nice familiar other frame to work with. If I look at that frame with relative velocity 3 fifths, well, let me calibrate its time and position axes. That's the, any time I have another, an other frame, that's what I do. I say, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, I'm going to choose the origin of the other frame to be 0, 0, it agrees with my home frame. That's our standard thing. And let me just do this. Uh, I've got this. 3 fifths means, to where am I? Ah, here we go. Something like this, I hope. 2 going up. Three fifths, okay. Yeah, th three fifths, okay. That's pretty promising. I hope. Let's see. I'll just draw this and cross my fingers. Okay. Well, that didn't quite work, but it's pretty close. That is my. This line then is my t prime axis. I guess it's my alpha t prime axis because I can calibrate it. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1.0. Uh, 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, 1.8, 2.0. Okay, I've got my calibrated time axis in the other frame. And for the x prime axis, I just take the reciprocal slope of that. I can come down and say, all right, uh, 3 fifths, uh, 3, 3 fifths, this. Hope I get this right. 3 fifths. Let's draw my line. Oh, hang on. Slid. It's important to get this one. This one's more important to get right than the T prime axis, to be honest. Okay, here then is my X prime axis, really my alpha X prime axis, since uh, uh, X prime equals one over, one over alpha will be the one on this. And let's calibrate it 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Well, that's exciting and not surprising now. 1.0 is at that point. <laughs> I, I guess I'm, when I hit the x, x prime equals 1 over alpha prime, the, the 1.0 hyperbola, that's 1.0 on my axis. That It has to be the case because I'm hitting that hyperbola. That's interesting. That's actually really interesting. That tells me, I dropped a marker, excuse me. That tells me that in my other frame, At the time t prime equals zero, x prime equals alpha x prime is 1.0, 1 over alpha. That's already a little weird because x equals 1 over alpha, t equals zero. x prime equals 1 over alpha, and I'm curious to know what the velocity is. Let me try to eyeball a line tangent to the hyperbola at this point. That's the instantaneous velocity line of my accelerated observer. And if I try to do that at this point of t prime equals zero, if I try to do that at that point, this is pretty close, I hope, to tangent. Let's try it. That is my instantaneous velocity line. OK, well, that's hard to see. But um, that's my instantaneous velocity line. If you look at that line carefully, and you can do this mathematically too, you'll see that that line has, in my home frame diagram, exactly slope 3 fifths. At that instant of t prime equals 0, u prime is also 0. So let's be clear about this. In our home frame, at time t equals 0, the thing was at rest in the home frame and a distance 1 over alpha away as measured in the home frame. In this other frame, t prime equals 0 corresponds to a totally different event on the accelerated world line. But at that t prime equals 0 time, u prime equals 0 and x prime equals 1 over alpha. And obviously there's nothing magical about v equals 3 fifths here. I could have chosen any velocity I wanted and any velocity 
would have given me this same result, the same weird result that is the same thing. So in fact, at, in any other frame, at t prime equals zero in any frame, this accelerated observer will have this will look like it's at rest. That is the first of these really weird things that comes up when you think about uh, because the path of the accelerated observer matches our structure of space-time. It means there's this weird coincidence that every inertial frame thinks that the accelerated observer comes to rest at time equals zero, based on the coordinates we chose, and is, and is the same distance away. That's weird. But it gets weirder. Actually, this, this gives us an opportunity because, okay, if the accelerated observer at that event is in the v equals three-fifths frame, so that means this line here, this, this straight line through the origin, is a time slice. Not just for, the prime, for that other frame, but in that instant, it is in that instant an instantaneous time slice, the current time slice for the accelerated observer. So this is where I'm going to get a little weird. I'm, and it's got to be the same for every, every possible time, not just that v. But if I drew some other v's in here, you know, and here, look, I'm going to draw a line from the origin. It goes off in some weird direction. Look. There, that's some other frame, right? And instantaneously, at that moment where we intersect the hyperbola, instantaneously, this is a time slice of the hyperbola at that point. Or, you know, here's another one. Um, I'll keep this here. Uh, here's another one. Whee! There's another place where that's an instantaneous time slice of this hype, of this observer. Or even down here, right? I can start here and say. What do I have going down? Well, there we go. That is going to be an instantaneous time slice for the accelerated observer at that event. All right, if, you, if, we, if you're willing to be a little bit crazy with this, if you're willing to take a little bit of a stretch of what this means, we can say that for that observer, say at this instant, the one we first looked at, along our x prime axis at v equals 3 fifths, we can say that any event that's along that line, that observer will say is at whatever their proper time is, tau, for that line. Whatever the proper time is there, we'll just define that to be tau for every event along this line, because that's the instantaneous time slice for that observer corresponding to that. You know, we're, the only weird thing is we're accustomed to time slices being things that are these sort of parallel lines but they're only parallel because our usual observers in special relativity are inertial. If we're changing velocity, it's only, it's only sensible that our time slices will also change their angle over, at, over time. The only part that's crazy is that as they change their angle, they all go through the same point. They all go through the origin. Every single time slice of this accelerated observer goes through the origin. So things to say, for example, we're never going to have, this observer will never have a time slice that passes through this point, because that's above the origin. It's not there. The time slices are always in that wedge between minus speed of light and plus, plus speed of light. Uh, we know that, that they'll never have a time slice that will go through. I guess I have, could have a time slice that comes over here, but when you go to the left of that point where all the time slices intersect, things get weird. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but okay, so what sense do we make of this? Let's define Define accelerated observer coordinates tau and chi for an event. I'll put this in parens just to have that. For an event, t1 and not curvy thumb something, t1 and x1. So I'll call it tau1 and chi1. Uh, the, if I have an event, T1, X1, I don't know, uh, call it here. There's an event. Some event here. I'm going to define the accelerated observer coordinates for, the event, for that event in the following way. I'm going to say that tau is given by whichever time slice that T1, X1 lies, rests on. Look at what the proper time is on, for, the observe, for the accelerated observer that matches it. So uh, you can work this out. It's kind of a pain, but you can work out what is the tau on the time slice that goes through t1x1. You get the following. You get that tau equals 1 over alpha 
times, and make sure I get this right, uh, times the inverse tangent, arc tangent, uh, hyperbolic tangent, inverse hyperbolic tangent of t1 over x1. And I guess that's tau1, the, the coordinate of event 1, whatever that is, is arc tangent of t1 over x1 times 1 over alpha. Okay? And then for the position of that event, what I'll do is say, okay, along that, each one of those x prime axes has its own implicit calibration from the hyperbolas, from the usual calibration in the other frame that is instantaneously at rest for the accelerated observer, so I can use that calibration. Here, I start at, at chi equals zero, the position equals zero is where the observer, the accelerated observer is, and I'm, looks like two things over, so minus 0.4 over alpha would be this. So, in general, I can write this as chi one equals the square root of x1 squared minus t1 squared, it turns out. That's, that's how we'll measure that. And just to make it zero at the location of this, uh, of this observer, I'm going to do a minus 1 over alpha. Some people will leave out that minus 1 over alpha and will say, okay, my accelerated observer will call this point zero, and they, then we'll say they're always at position 1 over alpha. I prefer to say the accelerated observer is at zero, but it'll, the 1 over alpha is a bit of a pain here, but I like it better for this conceptual idea. That we're going to measure along this time slice, use the implicit scale of this time slice to measure the position. Okay, I've got those things. It turns out that those are equivalent. If I wanted to reverse it and write it the other way, those, those definitions are equivalent to the following, to saying that T1 is equal to, uh, well, I guess, chi1 plus 1 over alpha times cinch of alpha tau, and x1, uh, alpha tau1, rather, x1 is equal to chi1. Do I have that right? Check. I may be backward on this, so no, I guess I, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Chi1 plus 1 over alpha times the cosh, the hyperbolic cosine of alpha tau1. <laughs> if you notice, these are exactly the same as what we came up with earlier. If I plug in chi1 equals 0, I'm just following the hyperbola of the observer himself or herself. Uh, that is the, the same point. T the, this, is, this is just a bit more general. Uh, this actually tells me then that constant position, constant curves of constant chi1 are going to be just the other hyperbolas. So the constant curve of chi1 equals minus 0.4 alpha would be this hyperbola on here. The constant curve of chi1 equals 1 alpha would be this hyperbola, the, the uh, x equals 2 hyperbola, 2 over alpha hyperbola. So uh, these hyperbolas here are actually the curves of constant position in this coordinate system, and these straight lines through the origin are the curves of constant time in this story. It's pretty neat to me that that works out to be the same, that that works out right. It's pretty neat to me that we have this relationship and that we can define what the coordinates of an accelerated observer would be, or at least one sensible definition of what coordinates for an accelerated observer would be. We can come up with that definition. It's pretty nice. Uh, there are actually some nice consequences of this that I want to talk about, just to sort of talk through it. We've said those things. First thing, the coordinate system I've described here there is actually a, that is actually well known in general relativity as what are called Rindler, Rindler coordinates. And Rindler coordinates in general relativity are in fact the coordinates of an, of an observer with constant acceleration. So this scheme of defining, uh, of defining a time and a position coordinate based on the instantaneous time slices of our accelerated observer is exactly what you would get in a general relativity analysis for this. Uh, you said you, we, we thought we might need general relativity to understand this. Well, it turns out that our special relativity intuition is good enough 
for conscious acceleration to understand exactly what's going on, that these are the coordinates. Uh, so that's one observation. Um, other observations to notice. Uh, notice that there, if there was some explosion at this event here, time 1.4, position 0.2, uh, in units of 1 over alpha. If there was some explosion there and spread light out along a, cone, a light cone as usual, the accelerated observer will never hear about it. In fact, no event that is above this wedge, this wedge of space here, no event above that wedge can ever send a message to the accelerated observer in any way. Conversely, no event below the wedge can ever receive a message from the accelerated observer. This, the wedge that is accessible to the accelerated observer is called the Rindler wedge because of Rindler coordinates. And those are the only points in space and time that that observer can potentially talk to and from. So we've got that. Um, other things I want to comment on. Um, another interesting thing is to just comment that, uh, that uh, uh, comment on what the, what the observer's space and time will look like. This is an inertial observer's perspective of, now we understand within this wedge, constant time and constant position lines for as perceived by the accelerated observer. You could ask, what does the accelerated observer see? What is the accelerated observer's equivalent of this graph? And as it happens, I've printed one out. Uh, hey, look. Ooh. Uh, maybe I'll hold it, I'll, I'll stick it up there in a minute. But the thing to notice here is the, these are lines of constant t and constant x as, as viewed from the accelerated observer's coordinate system. So, for example, the, uh, the line vertically over here is a line at uh, chi. Uh, uh, I guess this is the line of chi equals minus 1 over alpha. And that is x equals 0 all along this line. The next dark line here, we, okay, I should be looking at this. The next dark line, this one, is the path of x equals zero in the accelerated observer's frame. That path of x equals zero over time, you can see that time equals zero, the accelerated observer is at x equals zero, and at early times, uh, early times, x equals zero appears to be at position one over alpha. At late times, in the accelerated observer's perspective, that is again at uh, position minus one over alpha. And so they come, that, the idea is that the x equals zero observer comes closer, is right there, and then, uh, I guess, well, this is, the, uh, is right there, chi equals zero, x equals one over alpha uh, observer, comes right there and goes away. So this is what it looks like. Uh, lines of constant time are interesting. The, this business, these, you can see these lines are pretty parallel here, but then they spread out. These lines are our constant time lines. And one thing that's point, that this points out is that from the point of view of our accelerated observer, uh, someone over here uh, along this path who goes at x equals, let's see, uh, x equals uh, 1, 2, 3, x equals 3, call it x, x equals 3 alpha prime, so chi equals 2 alpha prime. Uh, this observer in the t we'll go through times, time equals minus one, time equals zero, time equals plus one. From minus one to plus one looks about the same, and you know, it's accelerated, it's got something, but it's, that's this sort of distance, this time of observer time. Back here, the x equals, the observer who's at uh, x equals one over alpha, so x, so at chi equals zero at that point, this observer, their time equals minus one is all the way down here somewhere their time equals plus one is all the way up here somewhere. So the accelerated observer sees this clock ticking much more slowly than this one is. It takes much longer for this, for this observer to go from here to here than it does for this observer to go from here to here. But here the clocks are ticking a bit more slowly again. So what this really comes up to is saying that our accelerated observer thinks that clocks tick faster over here and slower as they get closer and closer to that x equals uh, x equals zero point uh, x equals zero so chi equals minus one over alpha point this line is some sort of weird horizon where clocks stop ticking entirely someone who is in the inertial frame at that x equals zero point the accelerated observer will see no clock ticking at all and that actually makes some sense 
the, where can I stick this? Here. I'll just stick it here. Yeah. yeah. That actually makes some sense because the range of times inside that Rindler wedge close to x equals zero are very small. The whole, I mean, the entire future and past of the accelerated observer, their time slices come into here. That's just some tiny little fraction of time for these other observers. They're hanging out here just fine, but the accelerated observer only sees them from here to here, and that goes from time equals negative infinity to positive infinity for our accelerated observer. Final observation, so it's weird. There's this horizon beyond which all is mystery to our accelerated observer, beyond which time and space don't make sense. This connects in with one final point I want to make, and that is the equivalence principle. Einstein's equivalence principle, which talks about uh, accelerated, uh, which talks about how acceleration is equivalent to gravity in general relativity. If acceleration is equivalent to gravity, the, an observer under constant acceleration is equivalent, must, must experience the same things that someone in a constant gravitational field would experience. And what's that mean? A, a constant gravitational field would mean one where uh, it doesn't get weaker as you go away, as you go up, or as stronger as you go down. It's just constant everywhere. But what this tells us is that for this, in this equivalence principle, this tells us that accelerated observers will perceive themselves to be feeling gravity pulling them. I guess the gravity would feel like it's pulling them in the minus x direction because they'd be pushed into the back of their seats and their rocket pushes them in the plus x direction. They would be as if there was some heavy object behind them, something really heavy back here, and pulling them backward. And they perceive that if you, as you get closer to that heavy thing behind them, your clocks run slower, and the clocks there run slower and slower and slower. As you get farther away from it, your clocks run faster and faster and faster. And so there's that, that's, a, that's a consequence of this idea of our, of our measurements of constant acceleration, our conclusions about constant acceleration in this graph. One consequence is this, in the equivalence principle, the idea that being closer to a heavy gravitational object will slow down clocks. Being farther away will speed them up relative to something in the middle. And that's actually a cool conclusion. If you think back to the twin paradox and uh, the key point there being, oh, the time slices uh, change over time, uh, you can, if you look back at twin paradox space-time diagrams, you'll see that what they look like is, oh, in that turnaround point, that observer feels like they're feeling an acceleration in that turnaround motion, and that acceleration will feel like a heavy mass behind them, farther away from home, and they'll think their clock is running slow because they're close to that heavy mass compared to their twin far away from that heavy mass, and that's why they think their twin's clock catches up in that quick period. It's because of that equivalence principle as if it's a gravitational field, uniform field that's stemming all the way from where the twin, the moving twin is to the twin at home. So that's, uh, that's its own little story. I won't go into that in much detail. But the point is, we've learned a lot about accelerated motion and how even accelerated observers perceive space and time just from studying special relativity. Uh, you could try this in general relativity, but that's a lot more machinery to learn. Here, we get a lot of information just from this. And I think it's pretty cool.